Friday, everyone. Wow, wow, wow. I wish it could just be in this app, man. Causing us chaos. Elon Musk, please do this for me. Add Twitter into Restream. I'd really appreciate that. Um, what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about family businesses and boards. How fun, right? <laughs> I find this really funny because our family business has our board meeting next week. So this week has been all like the board prep chaos, which is fun for everybody. Family businesses and boards. Start now. For some reason, it always starts on mute. No, I don't want to invite people. Okay, Twitter is there now. Great. So, how was everyone's week? Firstly, on a Friday, we do check-ins. How was the week? Did things go well? Did things go badly? I think you can see my energy is so much better than last Friday. <laughs> last Friday, I was having a rough week. This Friday, much better. I got a lot done this week. Yay for me. But um, you have to always assess. So what worked? What didn't work? What moved off the to-do list? What was added? Who was a great a person you're grateful for this week? Send them a message on a Friday. That's a nice thing to do. Sometimes I do that. I read that somewhere. You can't be anxious and you can't be upset if you're being grateful. So you can wake up in the morning and send someone a message. Thank you for helping me with this project. Or thank you for doing that. Or thank you for saying this. It adds something to their day and to yours. So let's challenge ourselves this Friday. Let's all send a thank you message to someone who did something for you this week, who pushed you, who encouraged you, who delivered something on time, who introduced you to a new concept, who was there for you, who was kind, who gave you a hug, or a smile, or paid for your lunch. There's always someone to be grateful for. Send a message to someone. Thank you for doing this for me this week. Make their day, make their week, and feel the gratitude in your heart. That is a wonderful thing to add into your reflections. So measure, measure, measure. See what you're doing. And it's also the end of the month. Oh my gosh, it came so fast. You know, I hate it when the beginning of the month is Sunday because I like to do my end of the month reflections on a Sunday, but I want it to be like the 30th. I wish months were nice and tidy that way. At least I have to do that on Saturday. Um, how did the month go? What is making noise on Twitter? I don't know what that is. Think about it. What were your goals at the beginning of the month? What were your priorities this month? Did you actually do them? Did you tackle them? Did you face them? Did you not do them at all? Did you have an obstacle you overcame? There are things to do. This is why people journal, so that you track this stuff. And then with time, you'll see how you change. This month, I've been in so much pain physically. Oh my God. Learning this exercise thing has been really tr tricky for me, but I'm, I'm struggling, I'm trying. I posted some pictures on my Instagram this week and people laughed at me. <laughs> me complaining about being sore from the gym. But it was something that I prioritized at the beginning of this month. And I feel like I had slacked a bit last month. I need to put in more effort. I need to put in more time. I need to see why my system wasn't working. So this month I changed things. <sighs> you keep adjusting. You keep experimenting till you find something that works. I really like the yoga class I found. That's working. Jim, we're still suffering. I'll get there. <laughs> but you have to find what works. So adjust the things in your life. Measure the things. See what is working, what is not working. I promise it's the first step and it's very helpful and doesn't cost you anything. Just a moment of your memory and time. It's good to sit and write these things down. I would recommend that. But if you don't have time, just think about it while you're sitting in traffic. So now since Monday, what did I achieve? What went well? Now the whole of April. Can you believe April is over? We're getting to like the middle of the year. Where is the year going? Oh my gosh. So anyway. Do your reflections, see how your life is moving. This is how you make progress on your goals. On to boards for family businesses. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> ah, it's such an interesting area. So we've been getting a lot of questions about this. It's been amusing to me. Yes, family businesses need boards. I strongly recommend that. I understand my family business is quite large now, but even when it was smaller, it's not that we had formal boards. We had boards when I was... I think I've been sitting in family board meetings since I was 17, 16, 17. So it's been many years. We've not been the most consistent. There's been a lot of in, out. Sometimes we do it. Sometimes it's a month late, you know. We're still Africans. <laughs> but it's important. And I tell you why. Because you need that advisory system. Boards are like a mentor for a, fam for a business. So even a family business is still a business. And I think more so than regular businesses, family businesses tend to be dominated by the family members who started the business. And it's easy to be so caught up in your own business that you don't hear different perspectives or opinions. 
I remember I got to a point with Musana where I was fed up of people's feedback. I was just like, you know what? At this point, I know what I'm doing with my own company. Everyone needs to stop telling me, have you tried this? Have you done this? Why don't you add this? Put this there. Have you tried this food or put that there? or add this part to the car to make it bigger or make it green or add it, make it this? I'm just like, enough. I just want to run the company how I want to run the company, me and my co-founder, you know? So I think it's easy to get that way. And with a family business, especially one that started by someone and then it's built on for many years, they get to used to being in control and in charge and like making all the decisions. And no human being is perfect. You can't have all the views, all the perspectives and know all the information at all times. Of course you try, you do your best, but it's always good to have other people's opinions, who you respect, who you will listen to, who are informed. And that's why it's important. And on a family business, you need outside people. You can't only listen to the family members because there's family dynamics at play. Of course, you're not going to go and disagree with your family member there in the board meeting when you're going to need them for something else later. Do you know what I mean? If you have a company meeting and you know you're going to need to get a loan from your cousin there, now are you going to disagree with him in front of everyone? Nope. There's always a hierarchy. There's always a system. This one is older than that one. You can't disrespect them. You can't say this in the meeting. You can't say that. You, you can't. It's so hard to navigate family dynamics on its own. Everyone's family has family dynamics. I only know my own family's dynamics, but I've seen other people's dynamics and I've never seen a family that doesn't have ups, downs, left, right, arguments, disagreements, different opinions. And they all have a system. They all have a hierarchy. They all have a, this is how we apologize to each other. This is how we interact. This is how we fight. This is how we have fun. So now when you take those dynamics and add the extra layer of business, which has its own dynamics on its own, it's a lot to deal with. And it's a lot to navigate through. So I kind of see it like your leaders have to have a compass. They have to have a vision. They have to know where they're going. But they can't see everything. They don't see a storm coming sometimes. Or they don't want to see it. Or they are so stressed about a particular issue in operations. Or they have their own family drama that's going on. Or they're so convinced on one idea they don't want to let go of it, even though the market is not agreeing. We've all seen situations like that. That's why it helps to have external people who will call you out, who will advise you, who will guide you, who will say, you know what, have you tried this? Even when you don't want to hear it. There are people who will introduce you to their network or give you support in a different way or notice something you hadn't noticed. When you work in a business and your family members, you have so many other things at play at all times. You might miss this thing in finance. You might forget that there's this opportunity. You might miss a meeting here or a, a, a deal there or not get this contract. But your board members are like a safety net. They are checking on you. They are asking you these questions. They are making you think. They are making you analyze and assess. Are we doing the right thing? Is this the way to go? What are the options that we have? What is the legal way to do this? Because practically, we'd rather do this. But does it make sense? Are we allowed to do that? Who do we consult? You can have internal staff. You can have internal team members. I'm not saying all family businesses are run only by family. But when you have a board, there are people with authority in your family business who are not family members. And I think that's where the magic is. And that's the difference with boards with other companies. Boards for corporates, there's financial and there's legal responsibilities. The board is liable for everything that the company does. Proper boards, not advisory boards, like directors. And that's a different dynamic. If it's a family business and you don't want other people legally tied to your business, it's also hard for people to be legally tied to a family business, like to agree to that. But you still should have an advisory board of people that you respect, people that you will listen to, and people that come from a diverse background that are going to give you different opinions from you. You don't need yes men around you. The more successful you become, the harder it is to find people who will disagree with you and people who will tell you the truth. You know the story of the emperor's new clothes? The emperor who went naked and everyone just had to clap and smile because no one wants the king to be upset. You don't want to be in that situation where everyone is laughing at you, but they are clapping and smiling to your face. These are your staff. These are the people around you, your suppliers, your stakeholders. The man is paying us. Who are we to disagree with him? That is the problem. The more successful you become, it will be harder to find people who tell you the truth. People who are honest to you, with you, who hold you accountable until you last board meeting, you told us this is going to happen. Now you've taken us in another direction. What's going on here? Where is the logic? What is happening? Where are the funds that were here that are now missing? You've diverted them. You had a wedding. You built a house. What happened? You need to have people who hold you to that. And yeah, it's uncomfortable. No one wants another boss. You've built your family business. You're finally making money. And now this annoying girl on Facebook is telling you that you need a boss. <laughs> so it's not so much about having a boss, but it's about that figure in your life. No one is too big to have a mentor. 
there is always someone ahead of you. There's always someone doing more than you or who you can learn from. No matter how successful you are, you can always learn. You can always do more. You can always push harder. But isn't that what you want? Isn't that the excellence you strive for? I do. As uncomfortable as it might be, I don't like to be told I'm wrong. I don't like to have someone giving me orders and instructions and telling me why and where and this. It's no fun. I'm not saying it's fun. But I know it's useful. I know it's helpful. I know it makes me better. It makes my team better. It makes our company better. So I want it. Push me. Tell me. Call me out. Say, where is this? Why hasn't this happened? <laughs> One of my friends, they sent me a text. This is your first accountability for keeping time today. <laughs> I'm like, girl, I'm still at work. Relax. But I'm always late. And she's calling me out on it. Today, I should not be late. And I appreciate that. You have to have people who hold you accountable. People who push you to be better. We all have a lot of potential living in us. And it's hard to always live up to that potential on your own steam, you know, on your own willpower. The day is long. Problems are many. You also get tired. Sometimes you have all this energy. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you forget. Sometimes you're stressed. Like, I understand. But that's why it helps have a support system. The board is on your side. They are part of your team. They want your company to succeed. That's what they're there for, to push you to do better to make sure your customers are happy, your staff are happy, your suppliers are happy. Let's do this. Everyone wants you to move. Everyone wants you to succeed. Everyone is now a marketing person for you. I work with this company. They're so great. I have dealt with that company before. They are excellent. You should definitely use them. There is so much value in having an advisory board, in having a proper executive board, if that's what you want, if that's where your business is at. And also these governance things help with paperwork. When it comes to things like getting loans, getting grants, when you're applying for awards or you're nominated for something or bids and contracts, it looks good when you have proper governance in place because it shows credibility. It shows you're trustworthy. Even if you have a small family business, we have these two shops in this area and this is what we do, but we have an advisory board. And on our board, these are some of the people. Oh, wow. These people vouch for them. They back them up. They trust them. They want them to succeed means I can count on these guys. Because if someone has never heard of you, maybe they've heard of your board member and they trust that person. Human beings like to know people that we know. That's how you build trust and relations. When someone is recommended to you, they're ahead of the person who just dropped off their CV or the person who just dropped off their company profile. If someone says, oh, I've used this company before, they have the best mangoes. These guys are the best cleaning services. Those are the ones you're going to try. Not the ones you Googled and said, hey, I might as well just give it a shot. Who knows? It will be good. It will be bad. Mm-hmm. So there are very many advantages to having boards. And I know it's a strange concept sometimes, but think of it like a mentor. It's just a group of mentors that help your company, that support your company, and that want to see your company succeed. And that's what the business is about at the end of the day. So I really recommend that. There's always room for improvement. Oh, my favorite room for improvement story this week, let me tell it to you. So I was reading, and apparently... After every game, Michael Jordan's coach would come up to him and say, five, six, or seven. And he'd always answer with five, six, or seven. And I was like, what is the five, six, or seven? What does that mean? Every game, whether they win, whether they lose, whether he's upset, whether he's happy, whether he's with his family, they're celebrating, or they are, he's upset and he's going home, five, six, or seven. And what was he asking him? What time will I see you in the gym tomorrow? Five, six, or seven. There was no option of nah, or it's Sunday, Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm upset we lost. Five, six, or seven. What time will I see you tomorrow? A whole Michael Jordan, yo. A whole Michael Jordan. Every day, five, six, or seven, those horrible hours. He was in the gym. He was getting better. And that's the reason he's Michael Jordan. And he has the most records. And everyone respects him. And he has all this money. And he did the best that he could. Because he saw that potential in himself, but he was always being pushed. He was pushing himself and he had his coach, who was his accountability buddy, who was asking him 5 a.m., 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., what time will I see you tomorrow? I don't care if you made 100 baskets today. You have to be in the gym tomorrow because you can do better. You can push yourself harder. You can do more. Yeah, I know I can be annoying like those military guys who shout at you on Instagram, but hey, I thought it was inspirational. Michael Jordan stays in the gym, five, six, or seven. Really, who are we to say we don't want advice? We don't want feedback. We don't want guidance. We don't want accountability. It won't be me. It won't be me. And I hope it won't be you because there's so much potential. Release it. Let it out there. Get it done because you can do it. It just takes a lot of pushing. <laughs> Let me look at some of the questions. Where are they? Where are they? And I don't see them. 
Uh, oh, sorry, I opened the wrong one. Questions. How many board of directors should someone hire for a startup company? Kindly advise. Okay, so if with board members, what is key is that you have an odd number because you don't want them to have a stalemate, like if you have to vote on something. So I know typically it's like five or seven or nine moves like that. If you still have a startup and it's small, then what you want to do is have fewer. So I would say have one to begin with and then three. And then as you grow, five, because it's also a lot to manage people's schedules, information, everything. Maybe start with three so that you get three different opinions. If you don't have a board, maybe go and have three mentors who understand your business and can advise you on the business. And you start by having coffee with each of them like once a month. Then after three, four months, you'll be like, how about we meet as a group? Me, the founder of the business, and the three of you together, and I can explain to you what has happened in the last quarter, can give you some information, and you can give me your responses, your ideas, your feedback, what you think we're doing well, you think we're doing wrong, and accountability. I, these are my targets, these are my goals, this is the vision for the next three months, and then we meet again in those three months. So you want to start small. Don't wake up one day and say, okay, now we have seven directors, and we're in the deep end, and now we have to like do all the legal stuff and be totally accountable to them. So that's how I would suggest you do it. Go one by one, start with three in a group and maybe meet them quarterly is my advice for you. Okay, this question from this morning. What is the difference between directors and board members? Okay, I kind of answered this last week. I think, oh, not I think, I'm sorry. I believe legally, they are non-executive directors and they're executive directors. So there's advisory boards and then there's executive boards that like are legally tied to the company. So in all types of businesses, the non-execs are the ones who don't work in the business. So like these are the external people I'm talking about. The executive ones are like the CEO, the CFO, the company secretary. They work every day in the company, but they come to the board and then they present everything and they're the ones who answer all the questions that the board members are asking them. An advisory board has no legal attachment to a company. So they are just there to give you guidance, but if something goes wrong, none of them are going to jail. A real board, they have those kinds of problems. Um, if something goes wrong, the board members are responsible because board members have fiduciary duties and legal responsibilities. Like when you ex appoint non-executive and executive directors, they have to sign a contract. Like, yes, I agree to be on this board. Because like if something goes wrong, it was your decision. You are the ones who made the decision, who gave the CEO the information, and the CEO now made that happen in the company. On one of my boards, I'm in the government board, and one of my board members joked, these are the discussions that will get us in parliament. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, as members of a government board, but we are non-executive directors, if something goes wrong in this company, we are liable. So we would have to go to parliament and answer to anything that we did wrong or mismanaged or whatever. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that when I agreed. Not that we're mismanaging things, but that was a new one for me. But that happens even in like private companies. So if something goes wrong, the board like is in trouble. I don't think many board members go to jail, but but they are like the ones that are answerable to these things, you know? Because when you have a proper board, essentially they're like the CEO's advisors and guidance. And like also the board has a lot of power. Like I always use Steve Jobs as an example. I think that's the most famous time of CEO was fired from his own company. Like he founded the company, but he was fired by the board. Like they have that power to do that. So even with your own businesses, I think at the beginning, you don't want the board members to be able to kick you out of your company. Yeah, sometimes people mismanage things, but I think at that level, by the time Apple, by the time it got kicked out, they had thousands of employees. You can't have one person's ego making poor decisions that affect thousands of lives, you know? So at that stage, fine. Maybe if you're over your family business, you don't want to give your board members that much power, you know, at the beginning. As you grow, one day when you're a corporation with thousands of staff, <laughs> then they should have the power to kick you out. Because like I was saying, the challenge with family boards is, with family businesses, is the founders and the control and the way that you get attached to your company and getting you get used to doing things your own way. And unfortunately, when you do things that way, your own bad habits are compounded. When someone gets to run free without any kind of accountability, parameters, requirements, which a lot of entrepreneurs do, it's up to their own self-discipline. What time they get up, what time they go to work, who they deal with, what they do, they get to make these decisions without company policies, without any kind of framework, without any kind of 
not consequences, but basically most entrepreneurs get to do what the hell they want to do. I want to deal with this person. I don't want to pay this one's tax. I'm going to agree to pay that one on this day and this one on the other day. I'm going to take three weeks of vacation if I want. I'm going to switch off my phone now. Like entrepreneurs get to live how they want to live. You're not like an employee who has signed a contract and has to show up at work at 9 a.m. and have things and deliver in certain ways. So the challenge is the busier you get, the bigger your business gets. Those bad habits everyone has, everyone has good and bad habits. So the bad ones get compounded because no one will stop you. Right now, if I show up for work late every day, no one can do anything about it. Okay, maybe my, my boss can, but he's far. He is on the board. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I was working in a bank, I could not just show up 15 minutes late for every meeting every day. I would not have a job by now. So I'm saying that as an example of my bad habits. Everyone has bad habits. So having someone or a team or a group of people who keep you accountable helps to mitigate that because your bad habits start to cost people money, cost your employees time, stress, energy, sanity. You know, there's um, a couple of different TV shows right now about founders and like the dark side of the Silicon Valley founders. One is we, it's called Super Pumped, which is about the founder of Uber, how he raised money and how he ran the company and all his bad habits. Because when your bad habits grow with you, yes, you're doing well, you're growing the company, the money's coming in, your good habits are growing. But when your bad habits go unchecked, they can become so big that any small bad decision affects so many people, loses so much money. When you just have your one shop and it's only you with the keys and you're the shopkeeper and you're the person there, Hey, you're an hour late. It's only you who suffers. Your sales are the ones that don't are not there. Maybe you lost a customer. But when you have a corporation like Steve Jobs did with thousands of people and you're making decisions that are going to affect all their lives and the company and the money and the products and the services, that's why you need to have people who check you, who are looking around you, not against you, but they also have your back. Like you don't, you know, this is not your strength. This is a weakness of yours. So make sure you hire this kind of a person to help you and support you. To make sure that when you're making decisions, someone else is checking the fine print, you know? I have been in one of those situations where I saw one of our senior managers, he made a huge mistake and all of us didn't realize because, you know, you trust your boss to know what he's doing. I don't mean my dad, by the way, someone else did this. Not that my dad doesn't make mistakes. Um, and we didn't check him. We all just believed him when he said he knew what he was doing and he made these decisions and we all just kept going with it. At this time, I was on the construction team. I was like, okay, let's just do it. Oh my God. It affected us so badly. We lost so much money. So many people lost their jobs. To this day, it's one of the most traumatic days like in my career. And when I look back, it was one decision this one person made. And our pro what I see our fault as a company was, we didn't have a system around him. Whenever he made a decision, we trusted and believed him. He didn't share with us the information. It wasn't written down. It wasn't in an email. There was no contract. He just decided. He told us in a meeting and we all just did it. So I'm not saying one of us should have spoken up and questioned him or second guessed him. But I think if we had a better system at the time, a better policy, maybe if we had a board in that company and he had to explain to the board how he made that decision, someone would have realized it was a mistake. I would like to think someone would have seen something he didn't see or not just trusted his own ego or his blind spot. I don't know how he made that decision. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he was stressed. Maybe he forgot to read. Like, I don't know how it happened, but it happens. And then all these negative things happen from one person's one decision. And so that's why I think it's so important to have systems in place. You need governance. You need policies. You need teams. You need accountability. Because when one person just keeps making decisions on their own, yeah, maybe the first five decisions were good. We made money. We grew. We hired people. We built this. We did that. And then this one decision set us back so much. I swear, it took us like eight months to recover from that. We have never forgiven because me, I don't forgive. <laughs> That's one of my bad habits. But that is my learning about governance. It's not easy and it's not comfortable, but I think it's worth it because you'd rather have these uncomfortable board meetings, which can be tedious, which can be boring, which can be difficult because people are disagreeing. Do it every three months. But if it saves you that mistake, which costs you eight months and this many jobs and this much money and this much problems and this much scandal, it's worth it. It's like insurance. 
at the worst, at the least, least, least way to think of a board, it's like insurance. Someone is watching your back. Someone is checking your mistakes. It's like proofreading your exam. Someone is making sure you didn't make a mistake that's going to ruin everything for you. Someone is checking. Someone is thinking of you. Oh, you've decided this, but don't you know parliament is just changing the law in Uganda about this? It's like someone, <laughs> one of my cousins paid for a COVID test yesterday to leave the country. And then she saw Uganda no longer needs people to pay for COVID tests. You can't ask the people for a refund. It's a lot of money and it's such a waste of money now. And she was so upset. I'm like, sorry, girl, you should have known. But you see, things like that, if you're in a board meeting and you're about to change a company policy, we're going to build the next hotel in this district. Oh, no, 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 no. Government has just decided that this district is now for agriculture and this and this and this. So you shouldn't build a hotel in that area, you know, for an example. So you have board members who are coming from different fields, different backgrounds, different circles, different networks. So they add different type of value. They're able to guide you, to advise you, to call you out, to catch you, to help you, to support you. Oh, I know someone in this organization who can help you. Oh, this is how you fast track getting that license processed. Board members are super, super useful. I really, I really think they are. And I've seen the benefits of that. And I've also seen the downside when you don't have enough governance and checks and balances in, in the system. Also, this is why a lot of companies suffer with theft. You know, we live in a country where poverty is very close to everybody. Because someone around you, around your staff, around your team, around your customer is living with poverty. And so any type of opportunity to take extra money, people will do it. So I don't blame people who steal at this point. I understand. Everyone has pressures. So it's up to you as a company to have systems in place, checks and balances, to make sure you realize quickly when someone is stealing. It's your fault. Whenever we have to terminate someone for stealing, I'm not vexed at the person that stole. Bambi, they saw an opportunity and they took it. I am vexed at the managers around them. How did they see this gap in our system? How did they get away with this? How long have they been doing this? How did we not see this? How do we put in a system where it's too tricky? There's no opportunities. I put the burden on us. So I feel like you have to look at things that way. It's about getting a better perspective. You know how insects have compound eyes so that they can see like everything around them so they can like fly and be safe? Us, we don't have compound eyes. We can only see what we can see. And I think that's the same in companies, especially as founders, as entrepreneurs, as family members in a business. You can only see what you can see. Only the information that's fed to you, only the things that you go and see or the customer you spoke to or the supplier you deal with, that's the only information you have. So the more people who are looking at the other areas for you, help you to all see. And together, we have the compound eyes. It's a very weird metaphor, sorry. But together, we can all see a bigger picture, a better picture. What's coming? What's working? What's not working? What are the good things? What are the good stuff? What are the systems? What are the policies? What's coming in the future, in the environment, in the market, in the economy? So when you put all that information together, you can make a much better decision for your business. And don't you want to do that? And also when I think of that, family businesses are competing with regular businesses. So if the private sector businesses have boards and you don't have a board, you're at a disadvantage because they have more brains working for them. They have a bigger network. They have more people invested in them and wanting them to succeed. So they're going to pass you. So even if you just think of it as a competitive thing, if your competitors have boards, you should have a board. You need to also keep benchmarking and making sure you're moving together. Just because you're a family business doesn't mean you do things differently. At the end of the day, you're still a business. Oof. I think... Uh, okay, one more question. The board is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the company. No, Vincent, it's not. It's the opposite. The management team is responsible for running the day-to-day -day of the company. The board only meets quarterly, I believe at best, every three months because they should not be inv involved in the running of the company. Actually, someone also asked this last week, if the board deals with like the employees, no, board members should not be interacting with employees. It's the hierarchy system and it's also about governance. You also don't want corruption or information traveling out of the system. Out. It's about governance, respect, it's about efficiency. There are a lot of different reasons, but I think it's better how boards are insulated from the operations of the company. Yes, a board member can go and use the facilities or know the company or be involved in like as a guest, but a board member should not be walking around your business making decisions. That's undermining the CEO, that's undermining the system, and that's not proper governance because they're not qualified, they don't have the authority, they should not be involved. They should be aware of how things work, but they should follow formal systems. So board members are not involved in day-to-day -day things. They should not be involved at all. 
they meet every quarter, you give them an update on all the things that have been happening, then they give you all their feedback and advice, and they help you make decisions, how to figure out things out, how to assess and analyze, and then you move through the management through the team. That's how the day-to-day -day running gets done. All right, I believe that's all the questions. Yes, yes. So thank you for joining. Ladies, join the heart group. The link is somewhere, where is the link? We shall put the link in the comments on Facebook. On the other platforms, I have Linktree in my bio and you can always join the, the group there. That is a private group for ladies where we have lots of resources about entrepreneurship and career development. We have lots of experts and articles and videos and fun stuff. Everybody else, stay tuned here. Have a wonderful weekend.